So, hi, I'm Phil. This is Adam. He tends to be <laughs> a bit shy. So, <laughs> you noticed that Malkin already did the other talk. I'm doing this talk, but he will help with the questions, of course. So, I want to show what we are actually doing. If anybody has an interest in actually helping us, um, he can find some pointers. He can like get to know what would help us to get our job done. So that's a rough outline about, I will talk shortly about how the team is structured, then about how we communicate internally, not really how people communicate with us, um, what we are doing, what kind of documentation exists, if it, if, if it exists, um, and what kind of tools we use. And then I hope we have enough time so that people can actually ask questions about how the things work. Because if you know how the tools we use work, it makes it easier to communicate with us. It makes it easier to get started if you want to do a bit more than you're currently doing with your involvement with the release team. Um, so about the roles, commonly we say, and our homepage says, we're divided in with managers um, who have the final say, who have to feel responsible. Um, we have the assistants who do the actual work. <laughs> and we have wizards whom we can direct to tricky questions about where we don't know ourselves what to do. So some of that is true. <laughs> Especially the tricky questions part, so we're grateful that we still have the old release managers around um, to help us when we need it. In reality, though, it's mostly consensus driven, whoever does it gets to make the decision. So normally we have some kind of common sense and people pick what they want to do and when they are sufficiently capable to do it, they just do it alone and they don't have to ask every time, should I do that? Can I do this? Um, so the last point actually says, there's one exception. If you do destructive actions, you might want to ask first. So there are some things that are not easily recovered from. Um, in this case, you better ask before you're doing that if you're unsure that it actually works, but that works pretty well for us. So we feel as one team, it's not that we are always like looking up at our managers and asking them what to do, but it's really sort of we try to find a common opinion on something and then we decide on it, unless nobody wants to actually decide and then somebody gets to pick. So it's like other things in Debian. So the communication channels are mainly the mailing list and IRC. There's pretty much communication between us on IRC. Um, so the mailing list is Debian dash release at list Debian.org. Everybody can subscribe. We are handling this a bit differently from the code of conduct in that we are um, You have to tell me what you want me to do. Okay, I see. Like this? No. Okay. So, um, we are handling this a bit differently, although I think it's not noted in that we are actually writing a mail to the person and they see the list, which is a total no-no on the other lists. But we do that in the assumption that we are on that list and the others are not. So it's all archived. If you want to see what we are doing, you can take a look. IRC is not archived except in people's logs, which is a bit sad because there is so much knowledge in it. But it's for us an efficient medium of communication. So Debian dash release is basically also a public channel. There's no such thing as a backroom channel where we discuss things. Those things have existed in the past. Um, we do, though, have an internal discussion list 
um, team at release.abian.org, which is sometimes used for the tricky questions about how to announce something, um, how to argue with a maintainer, or there are cases where the leader contacts us about something and doesn't want to do that in public because he isn't sure what we think about it. So there are some threats going on there, but it isn't much. And yeah, I listed that because it's also in the topic of the IAC channel. Sometimes there are Titan pads that list like to do items. What's the left to do for Weezy? There's one. Um, Right. So if somebody does a capture on that video and puts that mailing address online, that would be unhelpful. Um, for the team list, that was um, the comment because it's not spam filtered. So if you want to get involved, the most useful thing is probably if you're lurking around on the IRC channel. Uh, there are some people who are not on the release team who speak there a lot. Helpful comments, a lot. There are some unhelpful comments, of course, but if you need like um, a discussion about a thing that you want to get like into Weezy, it might make sense to use IRC if it's much back and forth, but of course it's not archived. And you can also lurk on the mailing list and if you want to be sucked in, you're staying there, you're doing helpful comments, and at some point, we might just grab you and not trying not to let you escape so that you're actually doing work, which might, of course, be detrimental to other things you do in Debian, but okay. That's really important, release teamwork. So what we're doing is coordination a lot, like transition timing. And I know that people are unhappy with that, that they have to wait ages until they get the transition approved. But that's also manpower dependent and dependent on how well those transitions are prepared of the others. So you could, of course, make sure that they are not screwing it up. We're doing bin and imbuing um, related to transitions. We are tampering with bug severities so that the count is what we think it should be. Um, we're doing cleanups like removals from testing, of course, also partial removals of some architectures in unstable sometimes, if it's clear that this is the way to go. Um, we do some maintenance like on Britney, um, some other tools I will show you later. Um, and there's one package in the archive even we have, which is Debian Archive Keyring. And we really do a real lot of upload reviews. So that's our main job. We do it for proposed updates. We do it for testing now. And sometimes we also do it pre-upload when we are asked, is this okay um, to upload? As for the documentation, yeah. It's not nothing, but it's not much. Um, we really like that to improve, but of course, if you have a limited time and you need to get work done, writing documentation might be a bit on the bottom of the list. Um, there's some documentation linked from our team wiki page. Um, there's information about how point releases are done on a special page. Um, yeah, we hope that in the near future, um, we will have more documentation on that. So that's our team page, which basically says how to contact us, what we are doing. And you see there are a few checklists. There's a bit about Brittany. There's a bit about the transition track I will talk about in a moment. And for stable, you have everything you ever wanted to know about stable release management in Debian, but were afraid to ask, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the queue view, which actually, if you care about the stable release process, tells you what we are doing. Um, right, so tool-wise, I think everybody knows Brittany, um, which does the testing migrations. 
lucky enough, we now have Britney 2 running, which is a rewrite of the original wrapper um, Python script, which is actually more readable than the original version. Um, now, of course, I messed that up. So there's a um, repository for it, Britney2.git, and there's glue code in Britney1.git for historical reasons. Um, yeah, so that's just the wrong way around. If you want to run Britney, you basically check out Britney2.git and you look at Britney1.git on how it's really invoked. That's just because we, had, we didn't move that yet. Then there's the incredible transition tracker called Ben by Mehdi Doggy and Stefan Glondu, which is this thing. I don't know how many people actually look at those pages or know those pages. So there are a few, okay. Actually, if you're doing a transition, we are creating a page for it. There's an overview page, which is lucky enough pretty um, empty right now because we're in freeze time. Um, actually, what we need from you is which packages need to be rebuilt. And previously, you submitted a, like a whole list of manual collected packages. And what this thing does is you actually have an expression that matches on the packages files and says, okay, this depends still on the old one, and we want it to depend on the new one, and then you see which ones actually still need to be rebuilt and can schedule bin and use accordingly. Um, this gets also pretty, there you see uh, almost completed transition. It still requires people to actually look at it and schedule the bin and use, but it's very, very helpful to see where we are within the transition. Then we have a few tiny tools um, that we are using right now, like D, which displays you adaptive between testing and whatever we want to migrate, which is mostly the unstable package or the package in testing proposed updates. So if you're sending us an unblock request, it's nice if you include adaptive, but we will always look at that output. So even if there's already a newer version in Unstable, we will always look at the diff between testing, what's really in testing now, and the new version. There are sometimes some surprises where people didn't actually realize that that package before wasn't in testing yet and that the diff is actually pretty huge. So what that tool outputs is something like, okay, there are already hints in place, somebody already took care of it, like there's an unblock hint for this package ACPI support. Um, and then it starts off with how much changed and then adaptive, and then we go through it and say, okay, that's fine, let it in. It also helpfully generates the right hint for that. Um, there's the hint tool that does the lifting for the hints, like I do hint easy source package name and I get the version in the right syntax. It does the cleanup of the hint files, etc. cetera. Um, funny enough, there's also WB, which people know from the wanna build requests on the wanna build list. That's actually maintained by the release team for historical reasons. Um, and those tools can be found in the release tools git. If somebody wants to look at them, feel free to. Feel free to submit patches if you find them useful. For stable and old stable, we have the Q viewer. Again, I don't know how many people look at that. I think mainly the stable release team. Um, that's this page. This page actually displays all the packages that will be present in the next um, point release and uh, processed. So what we have at the top is a reason or rational for every package that will be included. The architectures that are already built, the architectures that are still missing because the security team released the DSA and didn't wait for the IE64 build like MySQL because it fails to build. So that we actually don't 
introduce regressions architecture-wise into stable. This also means that some things are currently not going to be fixed in stable without, uh, I mean, on IA64, because there's no support for that. Um, yeah, it also does versioning checks, like this package is actually, has a higher version number than testing, or has a higher version number than unstable. It does installability checking if it if the dependencies still work or if somebody built it on testing and pushed it into s stable or s stable security, which I hope doesn't happen. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that could actually be avoided if we had source-only uploads, but okay. Um, that's this page, which is... Um, it provides step diffs for review that didn't, I didn't show. They would look pretty similar to D. It's the same engine. And we're looking at those again to see if that's suitable for stable. And it also helps to generate the announcements. So basically, if you have any questions about what we're doing, I just wanted to do some quick overview about where our code lives, what we are doing, and stuff. Please ask them. I don't know how many people there are that are bit interested in what we're doing or interested in doing that work by themselves for us. Um, can you share an update about the idea of transforming Brittany into, an, into a SAT solver solution producer? What do you mean by update? Okay, so there was a project by Joachim Breitner um, to implement that, and he has it running concurrently. Um, so he has his own instance running on another machine and pushes hints to the real Britney, so that if it finds a hint that the real Britney doesn't find um, for transitions, that this is actually applied. However, the current Britney 2 code has an auto hinter feature that already figures out pretty m much most of the hints. So it's not currently that useful as it could have been if we didn't have the auto hinter, if that makes sense. Any further questions? Oh. <laughs> I would like to ask about uh, architecture qualifications. Um, you did announce or did start uh, talking about this, uh, I think, in April or May last year. And then, well, it did, nothing did happen for, I think, 14 or 15 months. And I think uh, that puts a lot of pressure or work on, on, well, developers not to know uh, what is the target for the next release. And I think that's very, very unfortunate. Is it on? Yes, I agree. No. Yes. <laughs> Give him the... Yes, I agree, we should have done it much sooner, and we will do for plus one, and I'm very sorry if that caused any issues, but I don't, don't really have an excuse other than we let it slip, and we shouldn't have done. He did say that we don't really have a solid excuse except for us letting it slip because we maybe didn't assign enough priority to it, but I think mainly it's an issue of actually taking the decision, which takes somebody to take the decision. And given the way we work, it's hard just as a person com coming forward to say, like, this architecture won't be part, and then the project not accepting that or something. So it's also pretty tricky politic-wise, so. Yeah, I know. 
but I mean for her it was really tricky for us to justify that we will really not have it as a technology preview given the effort they have put it uh, put in yeah so, so uh, particularly in the herd example um, uh, there was a question of so so when do we announce that it's not going to be good enough or that it is good enough um, yeah. and it's essentially the problem was we kept on thinking oh well if we don't say anything then maybe it'll get better and then it'll just get better and it'll be good enough but it kept on not doing that so at some point you have to say right okay this isn't going to happen um, and that's obviously a very difficult mail to write and it's something that you don't want yeah. to tell people so there is some optimism to say well maybe it will be okay um, and yes we should have done it sooner um, trying to work out when is, is quite difficult and what criteria you can put in place to make that happen. I mean, pr in principle, we need to look at it pretty late in the cycle in the terms of is there actually something really broken on it? I know it's bad from the toolchain point of view. Um, and to just shortly get back to Hurt again, there was also the thing that the FTP master said that Hurt will be removed from the archive if they don't make the release and they did a tremendous effort to do more months before we decided not to include it. So, and then it's also the question what hardware we have for that part. I know that's also an issue, and we have issues with build these. Um, yeah, I don't know. We will certainly lose architectures for um, VC plus one, that's pretty sure. Okay, do you have any ideas on which architectures are going to be at risk for Wheezy Plus One? Well, certainly S390. Mo that, in any case, um, pretty sure also IA64. There's a recurring theme of Spark, that's true, but maybe somebody steps up, I don't know. That's the thing. I mean, if you're volunteer-based, it's possible that somebody picks up like an interest again, but yeah, it's tricky. It's also tricky that we have so few porters actually who step up and say that they feel responsible for it, and that there are few persons that if something grave ar arrives on any part, step up and say, okay, I'm going to fix this. So when we did drop um, HPPA and Alpha uh, during the last cycle, um, that was a very bad experience. So it was announced as we are moving these architectures to ports, but basically these two architectures were screwed up um, in the way they were moved to, to ports. So maybe it's better to, um, to have the ports archive uh, better supported. Um, and uh, well, so that, that porters are less scared about uh, being moved to ports. I mean, we had that discussion with second class citizen architectures. But I mean, um, the ports archive guys are very few. And they do a great job. And as an incubation thing for S390X, it was great. And Alpha isn't actually, I think, from the last things I saw some months ago, not looking bad compared to the other architectures on ports. So. It's really silly that we have to re-implement everything for ports. It, al is, it also applies to want to build and build, well, build the infrastructure also. I mean, there are other things connected like DSA not wanting to have something that's not running on architecture that we really support and stuff. Um, I think it's hard for a project to care about those architectures if they are not in the main distribution, even if they are very motivated. The SH4 people are also very motivated and they take, uh, GCC takes a week to build on the fastest build they, they have. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, Doku argue, argues that they at least work on toolchain issues, which is correct, yeah. Which might not be said of all architectures we have, yeah.
Go on, tell us the name of Wheezy Plus One. I think, I think the name is overrated, right? <laughs> no, I don't feel like that. <laughs> but I mean, it was said when it it will be announced when it's ready. Arsi Baghi sadly already taken by the FTP masters without consent of the release team, yes. Ganef stole it for experimental some time ago. So, Jörg, uh, Ganef stole it for experimental, yeah. <laughs> so, Don argues that he should have stole uh, Scott. Any further questions, discussions, what we screwed up, what we should do better? I mean, we are open to critic. I mean, it's not all solvable, solvable with the manpower we have. And the well, assistants we have do a great job. Adam does a really fantastic job as stable release manager and as testing release manager doing a lot of work. Our assistants do a lot of work. So, okay, you're asking us, but I'll ask you back. What do you think went really, has, has gone really well and what do you think has, has not gone well? I mentioned the, the, the time-based freeze um, stuff earlier in, in my talk. There's some stuff we need to improve there. Um, I think project as a whole has to... Is, will hopefully start to believe that, say, when we say we're going to be freezing then, then we actually are freezing then. Um, and I think if what's, people start to actually think about that a bit more, that may help. Um, there is an issue at the moment with DI packages and how they're being um, handled. Because um, obviously there's, yep. people are busy, so um, Cyril has, to, has had to step in a bit there. Um, so that, that's something that certainly, if anyone has experience with DI and doing DI releases, then that would be helpful, I think. Right, so, so with DI especially, we had problems that there were no releases of any sort for ages, and it was always a problem like that. I mean, always for as long as I was part, I'm pretty young. But um, that's certainly an issue. Um, the other thing is that we would like to have the project fix bugs, which I don't see does uh, I don't say doesn't work, but there are too few people working on that. But that's not a release uh, an issue. The the release team can really fix. I mean, unless we say like you fix a bug, you get an unblock free or something, or, or freeze exception free or. Uh, but I don't know if we want to go down that road. <laughs> Incentives. Bribery. <laughs> Any other question? So let's. Oh, that is another question. <laughs> okay, so looking at DI a bit more, I know it's long been a problem that DI releases and the rest of the releases haven't worked out. And for a very long time, uh, UDEVs would never migrate automatically, all that kind of right. thing. Where exactly are we on that route? How oh, far we are? Yeah. I think DI. Yeah, should probably be continuously integrated in the main archive. That progress hasn't been made yet. Um, I'm not actually sure what's blocking more frequent uploads to Unstable. That we build the dailies from SVN and don't actually need to upload the changes might not help in this regard because there are changes in the DI package that are lingering around for months or years until they get uploaded to the archive. I don't think we're there. I think the UDEPS thing in Brittany is helpful. Um, 
yeah, but that's really a question for the DI team to answer, which isn't here, but I mean, as a team I mean, on the room. I mean, we discussed this over lunch one time. I think you were present too, but uh, there are several technical issues to solve with this. I think, I guess the prob biggest one is how to build and transition the Debian installer package. Because we, how it's currently done, as far as I know, the daily builds take the UDEPs either from yeah. unstable or testing, depending on mm. what phase of the release we are. That used to be a switch oh, you could okay. make. Yeah. Probably it's nowadays from unstable. Yeah. But it builds an installer that actually, if you run it, daily? installs testing, not unstable, which is same. I think we if will you, want to keep that the anyway. Then, but if you transition this installer, um, you have to have all the UDEPs that are built yep. into also to transition into testing at the same time, yep. or you upload another installer to testing proposed updates and build this one with testing UDEPs and just keep the installer from unstable out of uh, testing at all. That's are some of the options. Yeah, it's a question what we want to do. So DI is a pretty special package. If you upload it to Unstable, it will fetch the UDEPs from testing and include it in itself, in the init RDs it builds, etc. Um, no other package I know of in the archive actually does that. So in theory, if it would be possible to just do the normal thing like you upload to Unstable, you have stuff from Unstable and you migrate it, that would be nice. I don't know if that's possible, but that's really something. I mean, there are proposals on the list um, on how to do it. Yeah, it's not a really same question. But the DI team can use manpower. They really can use manpower. If you're, I mean, Working on the installer is not hard. They have their checkout script. You have a really lot of packages, but working on it um, is documented and is actually pretty easy. If you have QEMU on your machine, you can boot up an install and check if your changes worked. Yeah. Anything release-ish? Thank you.